All right, well, take out your Bibles, if you would, to 2 Timothy chapter 2. And of course, uh, we're right in the middle of Living Faithful. And uh, this has been such a great series. We've just gotten into it. And we're going to be finishing chapter 2 uh, today. Uh, while you're turning there, let's begin with prayer. Lord, we just thank you for the opportunity to be in your word today, whether we're doing it online or we're doing it in-house. Either way, Lord, every time we open up the word of God, it's living and powerful, and it's transforming our lives. I mean, there are a lot of books that inform. There are even some that can reform. This is the only one that can transform. So teach us, Lord, in our walks with you how to live like you want us to live, and really, as we're learning in this whole book, how to live faithful. So bless our study in your word this morning. We ask this in Jesus' name. We all say Amen. So here we are in 2 Timothy, and we're going to be looking at verses 14 through 26 today. Paul, of course, has been calling Timothy and us to live that faithful life, and when we do, we find fulfillment, right? Well, as we're covering the last chapters in this verse, of these verses, Paul is exhorting Timothy specifically as a pastor to be a faithful pastor. Now, certainly that'll be our title for today as we move through these verses, but I don't want you to check out saying, well, this is just for the pastor, because the truths that we're going to be looking at here are really applicable to all of us. In fact, if you remember last time in the earlier verses of this uh, chapter, he exhorted us to be faithful believers, and he exhorted us, he used four kind of analogies. He says, be like a faithful teacher, be like a loyal soldier, like a dedicated athlete, and like a hardworking farmer. Well, here, as he's telling Timothy to be a faithful pastor, he encourages him to, in fact, if you look at your outline today, that's where we're going, to be God's worker, God's vessel, and God's servant. And of course, that's applicable to all of us, right? God wants us to be his worker, his vessel, and his servant. So I think we're going to see how this really speaks to all of us as we move through here. Now, let's begin with our first point or outline. This verse is 14 through 19. And talking about being God's worker, and Paul begins by saying, now remind them of these things, Timothy. Well, what is he talking about? Well, he's talking about what he just shared, and that is kind of like the last verses of our study last time. Remember verses 11 through 13? We actually said that's an early church creed that was set to music. In fact, you'll see that in your Bibles, it's probably italicized or uh, put in a, a poetic form. And it was speaking of God's faithfulness. And he's saying, you remind the church, Timothy, about those truths, that we need to be faithful. Again, hence our whole series through this book. He says in verse 14, charging them or challenging them before the Lord not to strive about words to no profit to the ruin of their hearers. And so Paul is, of course, encouraging Timothy, who was the pastor in Ephesus. You need to talk to the church because there are some in the church that are, you know, striving about words that really aren't a blessing. Back in his first letter, 1 Timothy 6, 4, he had to say the same thing. He said, there are some people in your church who are obsessed with disputes and arguments over words, and they are useless wranglings. So there are sometimes people, people within the body of Christ, believe it or not, who want to major on minors. And they spend all their time arguing about this one little point and that little point, and, and they miss the forest because of the individual trees. You know, they miss the whole point about growing in love, or as the ladies talked about this week, and embracing love and growing in the things of God. They strive, and Paul says here in this verse, it brings ruin to the hearers. It doesn't bless. They, they get their eyes. They go down rabbit trails. By the way, that word ruin is the Greek word katastrophe. Maybe it sounds familiar, right? We get our English word catastrophe from it. And that's what happens to Christians who get off the track. And it could be just a little diversion. But over a period of time, they get so far away from the simplicity and the truth of God's word. And their life becomes a spiritual catastrophe. So Paul says you need to warn the church not to be caught up in these things. So here's what you need to do to keep them from doing that, to be a God's worker, Timothy. Verse 15, be diligent to present yourself approved of God, a worker, there's our first point, a worker who does not be, need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So here's his first metaphor of being a worker. And of course, in context, he's saying be a diligent worker, right? That word diligent means to zealously be persistent, to give your best. 
And, and why would a pastor want to do that? Or any of us, by the way. Well, he says that you might be approved of God. A worker doesn't need to be ashamed. Listen, my sole desire as a pastor is that I want to please the Lord. And that should be our desire as all Christians. We want to please the Lord. But in being a pastor, and Paul's challenge to Timothy, herein lies the problem. Our, our Timothy, as a pastor, you need to please God. But the temptation is going to be to please people, right? It really is. And you need to understand that biblical leadership requires that a leader take people to destinations they don't always want to go and to hear things they don't always want to hear. And so every pastor, and I would say spiritual leader, must come to the conclusion, do I want to please God or do I want people to like me? Now, when you're dealing with social media, that's what it's all about, right? I want to get as many likes as I possibly can or hearts. They heart me. And I want lots of hearts and lots of likes. But if you're teaching the word of God, that's not about all the likes. You see, if your sole purpose is to be liked, and then you'll bend over backwards to make everyone happy. And you know what? That's impossible, isn't it? So in the long haul, what you'll do is you'll make no one happy, including yourself, and most of all, God. So Paul tells Timothy in the book of Colossians, chapter 3 and verse 22, don't be a man pleaser, but seek to please God. Fear God. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord. That's the context of that verse. As to the Lord and not to men. Knowing that from the Lord, you're going to receive a reward. Sometimes we do things to be seen of people, but listen, your rewarder is God. So it's not just for the pastor. That's something for all of us. Now, he says here, you should be a worker who doesn't need to be ashamed. Ashamed because of inferior workmanship. And so as a pastor, certainly Paul is telling Timothy, and that's certainly a command to myself, that you must handle the word of God in such a way that you can, you can stand before God and say, God, I did my best. I'm not ashamed. Why? Because you're rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, this term, rightly dividing, is a great term. It's actually one word in the original language. It's orthotomeo. And we get our English word orthopedic from it. It means to set straight. So Paul is saying be a good worker. He could be saying you need to be like a good doctor, setting things straight. There's brokenness. Those bones are broken. You need to set them straight. And Timothy, as a pastor, should, should definitely be uh, involved in helping mend relationships, fractured relationships, difficulties and problems. And by the way, one man can't do that. And really, I can't do that. But you know what can? God's word. And I find that when you teach God's word, when you rightly divide it, relationships are healed. Uh, hurts are healed. Loneliness is taken care of. All kinds of issues are dealt with when you teach the word of God. So he could be saying that. But this word also has another meaning. It means to set straight. In that regard, maybe when he's talking about a worker, he's not talking about being a faithful doctor, but maybe like a faithful tent maker. You know, Paul was a tent maker, you know, right? That's what he did on the side to help support himself in the ministry. But the interesting thing about ancient tents, they were made out of animal skins. And when you're cutting the animal hides to make a tent, you made to make sure that it's cut straight. Otherwise, when you put it together, you're going to have a lot of leaks in your tent, and that's not good. So Paul is telling Timothy, cut the word of God straight. Don't deviate from the truth. Don't diminish the truth. Don't add to the truth. Give it straight. Cut it straight so that the people will grow. And boy, don't we need to hear that word today, right? He's going to go on later and say, we're living in perilous time where people are having itching ears. And they want to devoid, div uh, divide and separate from the truth. And you know what happens? A lot of times, even Christians will bring their own biases into the Bible. Our preconceived notions about God, what we think about, oh, that's not my God. Well, wait a whole second. It is, God's truth is truth. So sometimes we come in, and, and here's the problem. When you have a pastor who will rightly divide the word of truth, then you get people upset. Well, I, I can't believe that. Well, it's right there in the word of God. Better yet, one pastor said this. If you believe what you like in the Bible and reject what you don't like, it's not the Bible you believe, but yourself. That's a good word, right? And that's a recipe for disaster. I want to come to the word of God and say, Lord, what do you have to say on the subject? And I may not like it, but I'm hearing truth, and that transforms. 
Now he goes on to say, now shun profane and idle babblings, verse 16, for they will increase to more ungodliness. So again, Paul was saying, Timothy, you need to set these things straight in your church because you got people there that are getting caught up in these things that don't help people and they're profane and idle babblings. And they lead people, ungodliness means away from God. And, and this is dangerous so he says, shun them or reject is what the word means. Profane means unholy. They're not holy words. They're unholy words. And they're idle babblings. The word literally means empty speech or empty words. So stay away from those in the church who are going to speak empty words or even things that are not true because they are not helpful. And, and if you don't stop it as a pastor, and it was evidently happening in the church, it's going to spread. In fact, he says it spreads like a cancer. Look at verse 17. Their message, those who are like this, it spreads like a cancer. Now, the actual word used here is gangria, right? We get the term gangrene from it. And I know we got a lot of people in the medical profession here, and, you know, you un most of us understand gangrene. You know, you got infection. The, the flesh begins to rot and send poison into your bloodstream. And so very often it's not taken care of. You have to amputate so that it doesn't destroy the whole body, right? Now, most of your translations may translate it a, you know, cancer. And that's a good translation, a modern translation of it for sure. But think about this. Think about cancer. I mean, who here hasn't had someone in their family or someone who's a friend or someone they love who hasn't been affected by cancer? All of us have. And we understand about cancer that it needs to be detected early, and it needs to be identified. It needs to be diagnosed. And then treatment needs to be given quickly, right? And so no wonder why the Holy Spirit uses this very term here. Because God wants us to have a quick response to those who would go astray, get off down, you know, down the wrong track and begin to teach things that are not true. Leading people astray. And this was happening in the church in Ephesus. One commentator writes, religious deceptions are so infectious, malicious, and insidious that they are to be handled only with, and I think we can relate to this today, they should only be handled with protective masks and gloves. That's true. So if you think of how protective we are right now with the coronavirus and everything, listen, that's how you should treat false teachers or someone who comes in the church teaching something that's wrong or aberrant. Stay away. Cleanse yourself of that stuff. That's what he's saying. And this is why Paul is saying, Timothy, rightly divide the word of truth. Be a faithful worker in God's word. Because I'll tell you what, that, that cleanses all that stuff. It rids it. It, it exposes it, it, what it does. Now, he gives a few examples of some people who are doing this in the church. He names them by name, verse 17. Hymenaeus and Philetus are of this sort. So evidently, these were leaders in the church in Ephesus. Well known to the people, so much so that Paul need to, needed to identify them. That's pretty radical, right? You know, sometimes people get upset if a pastor or someone in leadership names somebody by name. Said, this person is doing something wrong. We've dealt with this person. Now it needs to be exposed, whether they're teaching false doctrine or they're causing division. And people say, I can't believe they're doing that. And usually it surprises people. Oh, it couldn't be that person. I've known that. But listen, if it, if it has to get to that point, you need to listen when someone in spiritual leadership is telling you that. And, and, but people get offended by that. But think of it this way. What if you have young children? I have young children right now. You have young children. And you hear that there's a sex offender living in your neighborhood. Don't you want to know who they are and where they live? You bet you do. You bet you do. And God thinks the same way about those people who would cause harm to the church of Jesus Christ. They should be identified, and here they are. They're identified for us. Having strayed concerning the truth. And what were they saying? Well, they were saying that the resurrection's already passed. In other words, there's now no bodily resurrection for the believer. Well, that's not true. The Bible says the resurrection for the believer, that's our hope. In 1 Corinthians 15, read that whole chapter. It talks about our resurrection, the new life we have in Christ. And because Christ is risen, he became the first fruits. We too shall follow. But they were teaching false doctrine in regard to this. And this was one of many issues. And so he says in verse 18, they overthrow the faith of some. And that's the fruit of people who would teach false things. 
They overthrow the faith of some, which really isn't that strong. They're maybe immature in their walk. Oh, I, I never heard that deeper truth. Oh, maybe that, oh yeah, maybe that's right. You know, whatever it is, and there's lots of, you know, deeper truths that you'll hear about in the body of Christ, and it takes people away from the centrality of the gospel. I've met scores of people over the year that have been led away from just the simplicity and the growth of God's word because they got off on one little tangent. Oh, you know, or it's, you know, it's like, you know, reformed theology. Oh, did really, did Jesus really die for the world? Oh, that, that, world, that word world in John three sixteen doesn't mean the whole world. No, Jesus only died for those who would accept him. He didn't die for, oh, really? Oh, that, that sounds profound. I've never heard that before. And off they go down some trail. And now after a while, they've got a completely lost mentality in regards to Christ's redemption of the world. I've seen that happen many times. And that's only one of so many. Or how about those that get caught up in the word of faith movement, right? They get caught up in that. Maybe some of you came out of that. And, uh, you know, all of a sudden, you know, you get sick or ill or someone in your family say, well, they just don't have enough faith because God is God's divine will that they be healed. And if they're not healed, it must be that their faith is, is weak or they're living in sin. How horrible is that doctrine when you're dealing with something like that, right? We start the book of Job on Wednesday night and we're gonna be disputing that very truth. Here's Job. God, God said of Job, God's bragging on Job, this is a righteous and blameless man. And yet Job was dealing with what we call sovereign suffering. God had a plan. And God sometimes uses sickness as a plan in our life to get our attention or to grow many reasons. But again, you get off on a tangent. Nevertheless, even though people get off on tangents and teach something false, look at verse 19. Nevertheless, the solid of foundation of God stands. In other words, God's word remains. Remember we saw last week, God's word cannot be chained. You can put Paul in a prison, but you can't stop the power of God's word. And here's the thing, even though there will be false teachers, God's solid foundation will stand. Jesus said in Matthew 24, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not. Having this seal, the seal of God's word, the Lord knows who are his. The Lord knows. And so there will be those that get off, but the Lord knows those who truly love him and stay on track. And that's what they do. John 8, 31. Jesus said this. How do you know if you're a Christian? He said, if you continue in my word, then you're my disciples indeed. And so we want to be doers of the word, not just hearers only. You know, a lot of people that come to church and have done that their whole life, and all they do is hear the truth. They hear it. They know it. But they don't live it. And we want to be doers of the word, continuing in God's word, changed. That's what God's word will do. Now, something I want to point out to you that's quite interesting Notice the two statements in verse 19. In your Bibles, they're in quotations because they are quotes from the Old Testament. The Lord knows those who are his. That's Numbers 16, 5. And let the, everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. That's Numbers 16 and verse 26. Both of those quotes come from the same passage. And you know what the passage is on? The passage is on the rebellion of Korah. Remember, Korah came up to Moses. Moses was the pastor, the leader. And, and, and a few of the leaders come up to Moses and say, Moses, you take too much upon yourself. Who made you the leader? Who made you the boss? Uh, God, you know. He didn't say that. Moses, in fact, was a very humble man. But, but these men presumed, you know, to be, you know, the leaders. And they wanted to kind of overthrow him. And so Moses says, okay, let's see who God has set forth as the leader. And he gives this quote right here. The Lord knows who are his. And so what happened? The next day, it tells us that Korah, along with 250 other people, many of them leaders, stood there and said, we want to be the leaders, kind of a thing. And, uh, you know, as Paul says here, their message would spread like cancer. So you know what God did? God opened up the earth and swallowed them all alive. And, of course, everyone was in shock, right? And Moses then said this, and here's the second quote. Let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. Oh, that would make me depart. I'm like, oh, I want to follow Jesus. I want to follow the Lord, right? So think about this. The context of these quotes comes in those who teach false doctrine, those who cause division, those who gossip and want to lead God's people astray. Paul, uh, Paul is telling Timothy here, you warn the church, stay clear of them. And the best way to do that is be God's worker, rightly dividing the word of truth.
All right, let's look at our second analogy, verses 20 and 23. Not only are you to be God's worker teaching God's word, but you're to be God's vessel. Now, he says, in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. Now, Paul has in mind, you know, a large estate, a grand house. And, of course, with any nice home, there are, there are things that are there that maybe are beautiful for display. They're valuable. And other things that we use every day, you know, silverware and stuff like that, plates and bowls and cups, things in ancient times, you know, were made of wood and clay, right? And he says some of them are for honor and some of them are for dishonor. And so we have that in our homes, right? We have something that's like maybe someone gave us something beautiful, a sculpture or something. We have it there, a nice painting. And then we just have, you know, everyday stuff that's in the home, you know? And think about this. He, he's saying a great house. He's referring to the church of Jesus Christ. And, of course, within every church, we all have varying degrees of gifts and everyone is gifted. By the way, if you don't know what your gift is, again, I highly recommend you get our series, Gifted. We've spent eight weeks talking about spiritual gifts, how to know what your spiritual gift is, and so forth. But we all have gifts. And some, you know, gift of teaching might be, and a gift of helps, gifts of mercy, evangelism, and so forth. And every single one is important to God. All are honorable to God. Whether we might see one as gold or we might see one as just as clay. They're all equal and beautiful to God. But also, some within the body of Christ be can become dishonorable, right? And he's referring to that. He's referring to these false teachers. So at one time, were part of the body, but they became dishonorable in what they were doing. And Paul is telling Timothy, have nothing to do with them, right? So he's talking about true teachers, false teachers. He's telling Timothy, you rightly divide the word of God, as opposed to Hymenaeus and Philetus, false teachers, vessels of dishonor. Therefore, verse 21, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, if you will make sure you stay away from men, remember he said, shun those who do these things, he will be a vessel for honor. So what is the commandment for us? Well, listen, we should stay clear of people who are involved in idle babblings, useless wranglings, teaching false doctrine, causing gossip, all of those things. We should stay away from that. Proverbs 13, 20 says this, he who walks with wise men will be wise. Find someone in the body or several or people you hang out with who really are wise in the Lord. They love Jesus. Their life centers around you. Hang around those people. And if you've been hanging around other people that have been involved in any of that stuff, start cutting it off, man. Stop liking them on Facebook. Stop like, hey, how you doing, man? Good to see you. Really? But you've, you're teaching something that's wrong. You're encouraging people to do bad stuff. You've been speaking poorly about other people. Stay away from those people. Now, notice the benefit of staying away from such people. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he's a vessel of honor and sanctified. You know what that word means? Set apart. And that's exactly what God tells us to be. He says, separate yourselves from the world. Be set apart. Or it can be translated holy. 1 Thessalonians 4.3 says this, this is the will of God. Sometimes we wonder, what is the will of God? Well, here's one of them. There's actually found six times in the New Testament where it says this is God's will. One of them is this. This is the will of God, your sanctification, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel, his life, in sanctification. In other words, I want to live separate to the Lord. I'm not going to live like the world lives. So he directs us to be separate from sin. And notice, he says, verse 21, you then become useful to the master. Now, don't you want to be useful to the master? Who doesn't want to be useful for the Lord? I think any Christian from the moment we're born again, we just, oh, Lord, what can I do, right? So I think about the prophet Jeremiah. God told the prophet Jeremiah, you know what I want you to do? I want you to go down to the house of the potter. So everybody knew who he was. He was probably a guy in the village who did pottery for everybody's vessels for their home. And so in Jeremiah 18, 3, he's talking in the first person. And Jeremiah says, I went down to the potter's house. And there it was the potter. He was at the wheel. And he was making a vessel of clay, but it became marred in his hand. So that he had to make another vessel. So the idea is he's working on the clay. And I used to do that for decades. My parents had their own ceramics company. It was very large, international. My mother was a sculptor. And so I worked with clay a lot. 
And, and so it, it got marred. It, could, it, it offered resistance. It could be that it's too hard. It's got maybe some particles in it, some grit, whatever it is. It offered resistance. And though the, the potter wanted to make something, you know, of great value, he had to make something else, maybe a common finger bowl. Now, most of us, you know, when we were in kindergarten, got to work with clay, right? When we were in kindergarten, we all had our chance to do that, or first grade, whatever, art class. And, and you, know what the number, and you know what the number one piece of art is when you're a young kid? It's a, a finger bowl, or an ashtray, is what we call it, the ashtray, right? It's the ashtray. And, uh, and it was there in your place, in your home, as a vessel of honor for a while, right? And now you have no idea where it went. Yeah, because it probably went in the trash can. It's probably where it went. And uh, the reality is this. Think about it. If you want to be used of God, what do you want to be? Do you want to be something? Or, I mean, no one wants to be an ashtray. Just put a bunch of butts in it, right? I mean, you really don't. No one wants to be an ashtray. But rather, he says, I want you to be something that's beautiful. I want you to look at verse 21, be something prepared for a good work. You know, that's what we were created to do. You know, Ephesians 2.10 tells us that. It says, we are his workmanship, created unto Christ Jesus for good works. He created you to do great things for him. I love that, to produce fruit. Now, moving on, he says to Timothy, and again, he's exhorting him as a pastor, verse 22, flee also youthful lusts. That word flee, fuego, we get our English word fugitive from it. You know, someone that's on the run from the law, right? Well, guess what? Every believer ought to be on the run from sin, yeah. fleeing sin. And, of course, the classic example is Joseph. He's taken into slavery by his brothers, sell him into slavery, and he's there working for Potiphar, who has many servants, and Joseph is elevated. He's over overseeing all the other servants, and Potiphar's wife, you know, puts longing eyes on Joseph. Come on, man, let's do it. And one day when they're alone, she grabs him. Let's, let's, do, let's do it right now, Joseph. And he flees. He literally fled, which is the wisest thing anyone could ever do. And what he's telling us here is this. We need to flee youthful loss. We need to flee anything that would keep us from being a vessel of honor, right? So he says you need to flee what is bad. But now moving on, he says you also need to follow what is good. And he gives us four things. But pursue, here it is, righteousness, faith, love, and peace. Righteousness means right living, what pleases God, right? How do we please God? Well, well, the Bible says by rightly heeding the word of God, Psalm 119. So as I'm just coming to God's word, it's right living that, come, that flows out of that. And then he says, secondly, pursue faith. Now, he's not saying pursue saving faith. Though that's important, if you're here today and you don't know Jesus, if he's not your, if you've never surrendered to him, then you need to do that today. I would say pursue faith, follow, run after Jesus today. But he's writing to Timothy, who's already a Christian. So what does he say by pursuing faith? Well, he's saying pursue after those things that make up our faith, that encompass our walks in Jesus Christ. Your life should be surrounded with that. And again, coming back to the truth, separating yourselves from the things of this world and get involved with the people of God. It was great. I was talking to uh, a gentleman here in our, in our uh, fellowship beforehand. He goes, we've just been coming here several months, and we just jumped right in to serve the Lord. And, man, we've got to know so many friends, and it's so great to be in a fellowship like that where we get to know other people. And I'm like, man, that's what it's all about. That's what we should all be doing. Get engaged. Pursue the things that surround our faith. He says, thirdly, pursue love. And again, that's agape, that sacrificial love, of course, exemplified in our own Savior who gave himself for us. Pursue that kind of love. Again, women's conference this weekend, embracing that love, living that love. He said, pursue that. And then pursue peace with those who call upon the Lord. How about a pure heart? Pursue that. Now, there's a great verse. I like this companion verse of this. It's found in Romans 12, 18. It says this, if it is possible as much depends upon you. Live peaceably with all men. If it's possible. See, he says pursue peace, but it's not always possible with everybody. Some people just don't want to have peace, right? They just want to argue, wrang looseless wranglings like we talked about. He says separate from, from those people. But for those who really want to walk in the peace of the Lord and want to grow in God, you hang around those people. 
Avoid, verse 23, foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. Again, he comes back to that issue. Stay away from those who just want to stir things up. By the way, he calls them foolish and ignorant disputes. Foolish. I like that word. The, the Greek word is moros. You, you know, that moron is what it means. That's stupid, foolish, idiotic, you know, arguments that really have no basis on truth, just trying to generate strife. Now, let me say this. Paul is not saying that we should not be engaged in someone who has a genuine argument. You know, they really have, uh, they're really, really engaging and wanting to know about Christ, but they have some legitimate questions and maybe it stirs up a little bit of, of strife and argument. Well, we shouldn't back down from that. First Peter 3.15 says should we should be able to answer anyone for the faith that lies within us. What, but what Paul is for, referring to here is people who have no intention of conversion. They're really not sincere. They just want to argue to argue and lead people away from the truth. So what is Paul saying here? He's writing to Timothy. He's saying, Timothy, I want you to be a faithful pastor. And in doing so, you need to be God's worker, rightly dividing the word of truth. And secondly, you need to be God's vessel, fleeing what is bad or wrong and following what is right. Now, in verses 24 and 26, now he talks about being God's servant. If you're a pastor, and again, this is for all of us, we should be servants. So look at verse 24. And the servant of the Lord. That's what you are, Timothy. But again, we could say that of all of us. Now that word servant is a great word. It is doulos, doulos. And it means bond slave or bond servant. Now, under the Mosaic Law, which is quite interesting, under the Mosaic Law, if you were a Jew and somehow you, you know, had several years of bad crop, you lost everything you had, or it was at wartime, for whatever reason, you went bankrupt. You could, of your own volition, indenture yourself to another brother and say, we have nothing, my family. Can we become your servants? And, and you could do that. And, and that happened quite often. It was something so common, it's actually put in the law. Now, if you did that, though, if you became a doulos, a bond servant, well, actually a servant, you can only do that for six years. On the seventh year, the master had to release you. And anything you accrued during that time, as well as your whole family, were to be set free. However, maybe you worked for the master, and he was such a kind person you loved him. You said, well, I don't want to go back to where I was. I want, to, I want to serve you for the rest of your life. Well, that's found in Exodus 21 and verse 5. If the servant plainly says, I love my master, I don't want to go free, then the master shall bring him to the elders of the city. He shall take him to the door and drive an all through his earlobe. In other words, pierce his ears. Big giant hole right there. And he shall become your doulos, a servant forever. So isn't that great? So think about this. Paul often referred to himself in the New Testament as a doulos. I am a bond servant of Jesus Christ. A bond servant was not one who was compelled to be a servant, was not one who had to do it, but one who wanted to do that. That's the word he uses here. Timothy, and this is for all believers, we should be bond servants of Christ. Not out of compulsion, not out of duty, but because we love the Lord. And he mentions five qualities of someone who is a servant or a bond servant of Christ. First, he is gentle. A servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle, considerate, kind. Now, sometimes that attribute of gentleness is seen as something weak, you know. You know, Jesus, though, was very gentle. Jesus was even gentle towards his enemies. However, when Jesus' enemies came against God's people or came against the glory of God, well, that's when Jesus stepped in and said, hold on a second, right? He went into the temple and overturned tables, right? But being gentle means that you're willing then to confront evil, but doing it in a godly way. But we should be gentle. We should be humble. Secondly, a bondservant must be able to teach, now, of course, in context, he's speaking to Timothy, who was a pastor. And in 1 Timothy 3 and verse 2, it's a must. A, a, a pastor must be able to teach, it says. Well, how does that apply to us? I mean, he's talking to Timothy, a pastor. But you know what? Listen, I think this is applicable to all of us. We're all teachers in one sense or another. If you're an employer, your example to your employees is teaching something. 
especially if you're a Christian, what kind of example you're setting. If you're an employee and you're a believer, you're teaching others about what Christianity is by your attitude, by your response, by your work ethic. And if we're parents, aren't we all teaching our children, right? Not only by what we say, hopefully we're having devotions with them, but even our actions, which, by the way, can be pretty scary. But we're teachers. Be a godly teacher. Thirdly, it says a bondservant must be patient. Oh, I don't like that one. That's my least favorite one because I get so impatient so often, whether it's in traffic or waiting in the grocery store line or whatever it is. But God wants us to be patient, especially in the big difficulties of life. In Hebrews 12, 1, it says we should run with patience the race that is set before us. Whether, things hap- whether the things happen the way we want them to or don't want them to, a bondservant is patient. Okay, Lord, I'm going to trust you. Listen, I wanted the coronavirus done day two. I don't know what day we're in, probably day 200. I don't know, but Lord, please, end this thing. Number four, a bondservant must be humble. In humility, verse 25, correcting those in opposition. So again, this comes back to that attitude of humility. But I like this word humility here. It's an interesting word. It's, it's an unusual one. It's called prautes is the word. And it means power under control. Power under control. In fact, it was used to speak of a um, domesticated horse. Prautes. It was domesticated. So you think of a horse, very powerful animal. I mean, horses are very powerful, very strong, can do a lot of damage. But you harness them right? And train them. And you have something that's very beneficial. It's power under control. That's what the word means. So we, you know, can do a lot of damage with our mouths, with our actions. But if we're under the control of the Holy Spirit, wow, what a difference we can make. That's the term used here in humility. But then there's a fifth quality, and it's willing to confront. And notice he says, in humility, correcting those in opposition. That word correct means to give guidance. As a servant of God, I should be willing to give guidance to someone who gets off. And again, that's coming back to the theme of Paul telling Timothy, you need to run the church in this way. Notice he says, if perhaps. Listen, you need to confront people. If perhaps, God will grant them repentance. That word repentance means 180 degree, an about face, right? So that they may know the truth. Listen, sometimes the best thing we can do, and of course, if we love them, is to tell them the truth so they can repent and turn around and get right with God. He adds in verse 6 that they may come to their senses. Because sometimes even believers can get off and like, what was I thinking, right? And I've seen people who are Christians who got off in something way off base and actually repented and got right back with Jesus. That's awesome. It's so awesome when that happens. That they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by those who do his will. Now, here he's talking about both, I would say in context, both believers who get off and then they come back to the Lord, but also those who may not even know the Lord. And, you know, think of you. Many of you come from various backgrounds, right? Some of you maybe even came from uh, doctrines that were off, right? Maybe you came out of Mormonism or maybe uh, radical Catholicism or maybe Jehovah Witness, right? Right? We have many stories of people in our own church that have come out of that, and they came to their senses, and they came to know Jesus, and what a transformation it was. We have a man, and he oversees actually one of our our, uh, fellowships here in our church, one of our ministries here. And he shared a story with our leadership not too long ago, so I'm just going to share a little tidbit of it. He says, I came here to church, this was years ago, and you happened to be speaking on false doctrine. It was a message on false doctrine, and you were talking about Jehovah Witness. And he goes, I, I, I was raised a staunch Catholic and then got converted over Jehovah Witness. And I came in and I heard that. And I was so mad I walked out of the church. He didn't he wasn't here for months. He said, about three months later, I came to church, snuck in the back back there. And believe it or not, you were talking about that again. And I have no idea why that would be. But I made some kind of reference to that. And he said, I, was just, I, I just had to make it through the service. And then as soon as it was over, I was out of there. And I was thinking, I'm never coming back again. Believe it or not, he came back a third time. Wow, that's amazing. And it was some time went by, he came back a third time. But the, he, he shared there was loneliness, there was emptiness in my life. It wasn't being fulfilled by this legalistic false doctrine. And I heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he said, you know, Pastor Ron gave an altar call and he came forward and accepted Christ. And here today, he's in overseeing one of our ministries here. Isn't that awesome? God does that work. And listen, many of you have that, that exact same 
testimony. That's the goodness of God. So Paul says to Timothy, love people enough, and we should do that too. If you see someone off the track, love them enough. And who knows, God may turn them around. So Paul is exhorting Timothy to be a faithful pastor, to be God's worker, God's vessel, God's servant. And God wants us to do all those things, right? For his glory, for his kingdom. But let me just say this, just as we wind down, as I was just thinking of that story, I can't think of a better way to end. Because, you know, you may be here today, or you may be watching online. And as I just share that story of that guy coming in and out of the service, maybe that's you. And maybe you've been coming to church here on and off over the years. Or maybe it's not here. Maybe you've come to church here and you've gone to another church, another place, or heard a message somewhere and just, I couldn't stand that. Or listened to it on the radio. Whatever. There's been those events in your life that you can look back and God was speaking to you. Get upset. But today, today, maybe you're here. And, and you've, you've been hearing about the gospel again and again, and there's an emptiness. And you know this is residing, and this is, this is resounding in your heart right now. You're going, I bear witness with this. I, I see this truth that is here because God's word is true, and God loves you. So you might be saying, how could I? Could I have a new life? Could I have a new beginning? The answer is absolutely yes. And that's what God specializes. You know, God has made it so easy to become a child of God. It doesn't matter how difficult, how strange, how crazy, how mixed up, weird, demonic, horrible our backgrounds have been. We all come to Jesus the same way. And when it's all said and done, we all become brand new. It's so wonderful. And he's made it so easy. I like to say it's as easy as A, B, C. A, just admit you're a sinner. Admit you need God. The Bible says we all sin and come short of the glory of God. But here's the thing. Not only do we need to admit it, we need to repent from it. Remember in this passage, it says that God might grant them repentance. Repentance is simply acknowledging that I've been going the wrong way. It's making an about face. I've been walking from God, away from him. Now I need to turn to him. And maybe today God is doing that work. So just admit and repent of your sin. And then the letter B, believe. You know, A, admit, B, believe. The Bible says in Romans 10, 9, if you confess in your heart and believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead, you shall be saved. You can have a a new relationship with the Lord. But I would take it one step further in that C, and that's making a commitment to Jesus. Because it's not enough to admit you're a sinner. I think everybody does that. At least we should. And, And it's not enough just to believe facts about Jesus. That's awesome. But it's actually making a commitment saying, yes, I believe Jesus Christ is God. And you know what? I want to follow him. I want to serve him. I want him in my life. Jesus put it this way. If any man wants to follow me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. That speaks of utter commitment. So I'd like to ask you today, if you would like to make that commitment to say, I want to follow Christ. Maybe you've never done that. You've heard the gospel before, but you've never said, yes, I want to follow Jesus. And maybe you're online. You've never done that. You could do that where you're at in your home. So why don't we just bow our our heads. Let's close our eyes.